couple of weeks before Christmas, and this is in the area of systematic theology slash um, Christology, which uh, what better way to spend an evening than talking about Christ? And that's exactly what we're going to do. Some of the things that, uh, that were reviewed with me are, were just priceless. It's just so good to get back into uh, knowing exactly and focusing, concentrating on Christ. So let's do so and let's uh, bring our hearts to the Lord uh, so that we can enjoy this time together. Dear Father, we would ask that as we concentrate on your one who is uh, in a class all by himself, a category of one, the most special person that ever walked the planet, but yet our Lord and our God, and I pray that you would help us to grasp maybe something we uh, have been shaky on before or learn something that is a renewed blessing in our life as we talk about the humanity of Christ. We ask in his name, amen. Okay, do you have a handout? I hope you have a handout. If you don't, then uh, that means you don't. But uh, we do have some. Does anybody, y'all, somebody need any? We've got them right back here. Okay. Well, that's good. We'll, we'll have now our faithful Loris. Okay. Raise your hand if you don't have one here. Super. Okay. Uh, before Christmas, uh, it, several weeks ago, we were talking about the deity of Christ. We're talking about the person and the work of Christ. And so uh, now we're talking about the humanity of Christ. And so we'll move through this as soon as this thing, you know what? That is going to help a whole lot if I do this one little action here. There you go. The doctrine and the personal work of Christ. So we talked about the deity of Christ, and we are talking about the humanity of Christ, but there's no way to separate the two. So when we look at this, and we just feast on what this word says, then uh, it leads us to the place where we should be. And the word became flesh. Now, you and I don't have any problem associating the word and then just move right on down unto the only Son from the Father, because that's who He is. The Word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And of course, this is uh, uh, something that, that we have most of us have really been raised to know that Christ is God. Now, again, if you, if you imagine, I just uh, got a note from Dan Brooks, and he said there was a precious little girl from uh, Bangladesh who said, now tell me again, who is Jesus? And I'm thinking, oh, what a great, I mean, that, that's what they were there for is to be able to tell and share that blessing. But you think about it. Without Christ, you know, what has she? She has nothing. And, of course, I've been praying for her. I, I can't wait to find out from Dan, you know, if she understood and she heard. I'm sure she heard, but did she know who Jesus was? So last week we began to consider that person of Christ focused on his deity. And now we're talking about the humanity of Christ. Uh, he is both, and this is, this is what we understand and, and know, is that he is fully God and fully man in one person, and so will be forever. He is fully God, which means complete. He is complete God. He is full God, and he is also fully human. He was fully human as he resided and dwelt among us here. And so that's kind of where we're going today. We're going to be talking especially about in the humanity of Christ. We're going to be talking about the fact that the infinite became an infant. And that's, of course, what our, uh, our Christmas season is all about. Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man. We see his humanity described, 
in uh, verses of last week, we talked about the, or excuse me, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the deity of Christ, and there were some precious passages that you and I know, and they're part of our heart that emphasize, in fact, you don't, you almost have to just put your finger in there, and you're going to find out the deity of Christ, but by this, you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Tell me, what, how, are, how are people likely to miss this? You know, when it says... Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. If, you, if that's what you know, that's what you believe, then you are of God. If not, you're not. So what does that put a lot of categories that we would say in our world? Uh, people are in trouble because they do not believe that he is come in the flesh and is from God, both of those. So tell me who it is that may be in serious trouble not believing he is come from God, that he came in the flesh. Pardon me, yeah. The, the Church of Latter-day Saints, he's a good man maybe, but uh, God come in the flesh? No. Pardon Pardon Jehovah's Witnesses, yeah. Now, this is not a bashing time. It's just saying we got to remember that it's not just a moral group that we say, well, let's find as much as we can to do with them. We, we've got to remember that if somebody does not believe, does not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh and is from God, and they don't confess him as God, then they're not of God. And of course, we could go on. There's, there's groups, but there's people that you would put them in the idea of humanists. Yes, Jim? Yeah, and those that don't believe in the Messiah. And you, and you say, uh, you know, I, I'm glad you're moral, but wow, then there's, there's something more serious to be considered, even yet. We're going to be talking about three things, and I believe it's in your handout. We're going to be talking about the humanity of Christ as it relates to the virgin birth, and then as it relates to the fact that Jesus endured human weaknesses and limitations in his human personality, in his coming and dwelling in the flesh. And then we'll be talking about Jesus was fully human and also sinless. So all of those things... This is what we're going to be uh, dwelling on in the next few minutes. First of all, we're going to be talking about the virgin birth. And how many verses of Scripture? Well, of course, we run into a lot of them during the Christmas season. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name God, God with us. Matthew 1, 18 through 25, pretty big passage there, but there. The woven into this is the fact that we cannot miss the fact of what he is and who he is, and he was born of a virgin. It happened this way. Mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph before they came together to be from, with child from the Holy Spirit. So it names, and her husband Joseph, being a just man, unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. We read this passage several times during the season. But when we get down to the next couple of verses, he considered these things. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So she'll bear that son. And Joseph woke from sleep and did exactly as the angel commanded him. And uh, he, he recognized that or he was told and he believed that that which was conceived in her is not from any man but from the Holy Spirit of God. 
But, uh, of course, I'm sorry, I should have got you on that page there. That which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Of course, many, many, many other passages, the angel answer the Holy Spirit will come upon you, talking to Mary. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. So there it is, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and he came from the Father. The virgin birth was, of course, the importance of it cannot be overestimated at all, but the virgin birth was the means that God used to send his son to the world as a man. He experienced the full span of human life, including the fact he, would, he came in his mother's womb. He stayed that time in his mother's womb, but the miraculous nature of the virgin birth testifies that he was not only a man, but the unique God-man. The virgin birth also seems to hold significance, for Jesus is the new Adam. Uh, this is a precious thing, and it seems like it's only been uh, really emphasized, but I know it has been through the ages, that Christ's true humanity was not an inherited sin nature. The rest of us who inherit a sinful, guilty nature from our first father, the representative of our race, Adam, Jesus had no earthly father. So he's the new representative of the human race, of all who would be united to him by faith. So the virgin birth is important here. Jesus did not descend from Adam in exactly the same way in which every other human being descended. He is in a class of one. And this helps us understand why the legal guilt, moral corruption that belongs to all other human beings did not belong to Christ. And of course, you and I take our whole identification from the fact and ask ourselves the question, who would you rather be represented by? The first Adam or the second Adam? And I don't think there's any question which way we're moving on that. Because it's, it, it would be a hopeless state for us to be represented as we were at birth by the first Adam. But now that second Adam came, fulfilling all the law, living the perfect life, was not even heir to the sinful, iniquitous nature uh, that we had because he had no human father. He had no son of Adam that birthed him. Jesus had, uh, we, we can go to the, the next one, is Jesus endured human weaknesses and limitations. First of all, Jesus had a body. Uh, passages, can we go on that? Uh, it is like Luke 2, 7 and, and passing, because we went through that very carefully. Pastor Paul led us through that, but she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in a major swaddling clothes. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Jesus increased in wisdom, stature, favor with God and man. He endured the weaknesses. He overcame the weaknesses and the limitations, but he did have a body. He was born... He grew childhood to adult like other children do. He grew and became strong. He became full of wisdom and favor with God was on him. He became tired just as we do. For we read Jesus wearied as he was from his journey, sat down by the well. Of course, we remember that story and went through that as well. He became thirsty and hungry for he was on the cross. He said, I thirst. After he had fasted 40 days, we read he was hungry. And, of course, he was. All of these things, the fact that he partook of uh, food, just like we do, um, when he was dying, he says, Unto my hand I commend thy spirit. He breathed his last. And we'll mention this in just a moment. Not only did he become physically weak in all of the work, the cross work that he did, not only physically weak, but actually, the angels had to come minister to him when he was in his temptation that he regained enough strength to come out of the wilderness. 
He was so weak following the beating, he received that he didn't have strength to carry himself hardly, uh, much less the cross. But the culmination of his limitations that we're talking about here, the fact that he, uh, he actually died, the human body, his human body ceased to have life in it and ceased to function just as our do, ours does when it dies. But of course, that was all with permission. God didn't die on that day. But his human body ceased its function. And of course, he rose up from the grave, a perfect body. I'd like to spend a moment or two here and read a paragraph because this, this was good for me to be able to get kind of clear in my mind, and I, I thank the ones that did great amounts of study in working through this. Jesus also rose from the dead in a physical human body. Though one was made perfect, and one that was made perfect and no longer subject to weakness, disease, or death, he demonstrates repeatedly as to his disciples that he does have a real physical body. He says, see my hands and feet, and that it is I myself. Handle me and see, see, for a spirit has not flesh and bones as you see I have. He's showing them that, teaching them that he has flesh and bones, not merely a spirit, without a body. Another evidence of the fact, they gave him a piece of broiled fish. He took it and he ate it. In this same human body, Though it was a resurrection body that was made perfect, Jesus also ascended into heaven. He said before he left, I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. The way in which Jesus ascended up to heaven was calculated to demonstrate the continuity between his existence in a physical body here on earth and his continuing existence in that body. And of course, uh, I don't know, for, for whatever reason, that gives me a lot of comfort. Uh, when it says it was uh, like our body in every respect before his resurrection, after his resurrection, it was still a human body with flesh and bones, but it was made perfect. The kind of body that we will have when Christ returns. And we are raised from the dead as well. Jesus continues to exist in that human body in heaven as the ascension is designed to teach us. And yes, that is a comfort, the fact that Jesus Christ lived as we did, but after his death and resurrection, it was a new body, a perfect body, likened to the one that we're going to have someday. And that's a comfort for those who have had loved ones gone on before. Let's see, Christ also had a human mind. The fact that he increased in wisdom says he went through a learning process, and it says he increased in wisdom and stature. In Hebrews 5, 8, it says, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Uh, there's a point there that uh, I thought, well, this is a good point. When we think about it, we have this kind of opportunity to learn through obedience. Uh, in what way did Christ learn? That's, that's kind of an amazing thing. You, he learned obedience to his parents. Uh, was that innate in him? You know, it's interesting to me that I, I can talk to teenagers and there's something in them that knows that they need to obey mom and dad. They just, they know that. They may not want to do it and they may not be doing it, but, but they absolutely do. But when you think of when you think of Christ, and it said that he learned obedience through what he suffered. But it also kind of gives us a little process. How do we learn and get stronger in our obedience to God, in our love for God, in our work for God? You know, a lot of that is learning through the obedience of doing what God tells us to do. Uh, it makes a huge difference in our life. He had a human mind, but he also had limitations in that body. How to be obedient to his parents? He had to learn that. His ordinary learning process of his human side, 
the human part, excuse me, learning process was part of genuine humanity of Christ. We see that he had a mind like ours when he speaks of the day on which he'll return to earth. He said, but of that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Is that a contradiction? No, it's a touch of the infinite. Him limiting himself as a human but of course, as the, the Father, as God of very gods, you know, that, that's, he's not limited. You say, well, uh, can I explain that one and put it in a test to you? Probably. Maybe you can. Probably not. But, you know, for me, it's just something to really enjoy that who he is and what he does. Jesus had a human mind concerning the day and the hour, he said, no one knows, not me, but only the Father. But yet, as God of very gods, obviously, uh, that would be something that would be well within his knowledge. But not when he was here on earth, he limited himself. Jesus had a human soul and human emotions. Now, if you think of how many times Christ showed emotions, you know that he partook of the humanity. He partook of his body, his earthly being, he partook of that while he was here on earth. He had a soul and human emotions. It said he was troubled in his spirit. Now that word, the uh, idea for trouble, is a word that's often used for people where they're suddenly or very surprised by danger or, or very, very burdened because something is happening. It says that Christ partook of that. Uh, that was one of his limitations. That was one of something he realized himself by living it. Moreover, before his crucifixion, as he realized the suffering he would face, he said, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. So great was the sorrow he felt that if it become any stronger, then he would lose even life itself. So there was a full range of emotions. Jesus in Matthew 8:10. Of course, he marveled, he was in wonder at the faith of this individual. Truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. Jesus had a soul, human soul and human emotions. He marveled at the, at the faith of the soldier. And he also sorrowed at the death of, death of Lazarus. Lazarus. He prayed with a heart full of emotion. In those, the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications. He was heard for his godly fear. With what emotion, by the way, do we pray? You know, we're the one that don't know all Christ knows, but Christ knew all that he was taking on when he came down to this earth. And he prayed with emotion. Uh, he was, he was, his heart was full each time he came to the Father. Let's see if, moreover, of course, when we talked about he learned obedience through what he suffered, being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all of us who believe in him. And how could he learn obedience? Well, it was maturity, able to take on more and more responsibility, the older he became, the more demands his father and mother could place on him when he was a teenager or a young person in terms of obedience, the more difficult tasks that his heavenly father could assign to him to carry out strength, the strength of his human nature. So to obey under more and more difficult circumstances, we find out that our Lord increased in that. We might say his moral background was strengthened by more and more and more difficult exercise. Well, in every respect, he was tempted as we are, yet without sin. The fact that he faced temptations means he had a genuine human nature that could be tempted. For Scripture tells us that God cannot be tempted of evil, but indeed the manly, the human Christ was in every regard. So Jesus was understand understood by the way to be a human to be he, human by other people let's see if i get to 
Matthew 8:10, and then, okay. You know, they recognized him as human. Uh, all the people that dealt with him, and you see these passage right here, Jesus finished the parables, he went away from there, coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue, they were astonished. Where did this man get this wisdom in these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? In other words, he's just like one of us. Is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brothers James and jo Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet, not without honor, save in his hometown, in his own household. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So he did not uh, cast his pearls before swines there, and he did not do the many works. However, they were recognizing him as something as just as they are, a human being. One of his limitations that he had, had while he was on this earth. Sometimes people would not believe because they're saying, hey, he's a man just like we are. And uh, where, where would he get all those? He must be of Beelzebub. He must be of the devil if he has that ability. And then, of course, Jesus endured all these human weaknesses and limitations because he was a man. He was come in the flesh. And finally, he was fully human and also sinless. Now, you and I very well recognize this. Um, fully human. He had a virgin birth, he endured human weaknesses, he was fully human, and also he was sinless. Human soul and emotions is what he had. Now we find in 2 Corinthians, for, the, for our sake, he made him to be sin. Remember, he was fully human and also sinless, but for our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This passage in Hebrews nails it well. Since then, we have a high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence Draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This one who was a man who came down was sinless. But the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. For you'll not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. But you denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked for a murderer to be granted for you. But the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. And in Acts 7, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one whom you have now betrayed and murdered. Therefore he says also in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. Jesus Christ, as we know, was fully human, but he was also sinless in his pursuit. Well, why is it, why was Jesus, and, and actually, let's see if I can make sure I get this. Oh, it's a quote by Athanasius. Such and so many are the Savior's achievements that follow from his incarnation. That to try to number them is like gazing at the open sea trying to count the waves. For indeed, everything about it is marvelous. Whenever a man turns his gaze, he sees the Godhead of the Word and is smitten with all. Well, why was all of this necessary? The fact that God came in the flesh and was a man. He was a man, he was fully God, he was fully a human, fully a man. So why was Jesus' full humanity necessary? Well, there's a number of good reasons for that, and I know that 
They were kind of just, even in the curriculum, kind of picking and choosing. But first of all, worship Jesus Christ so that we might worship Jesus Christ, who was the second Adam. Jesus Christ, the second Adam, our representative, obeyed for us, paid the penalty for our sin. Adam had failed. The first Adam failed. We would not want to be represented if you had choice of lawyers, you better choose rightly. And you would not want to be choosed, be defended by the first Adam, but the second. Jesus Christ, the second Adam, we worship him because of what he did in his humanity and the fact that he is the new representative of the human, our human race. And I think there's one of our songs that said he's the, the master or what the leader of our Christian race. What, what, is the, what is the song? I'm trying to figure. I just, I'd heard I was going to look it up, but I don't do good at, at finding them in our book because, you know, they're all pasted in the back and they're really good, though. So we worship Jesus, the second Adam. He's the one that we're thrilled to be represented by, not the first Adam. Um, therefore, as one, and of course, these, these verses, these passages are, are saying a hearty amen to this. They're the ones that are leading us in the way. Uh, in Romans 5, 18, 19, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men. So one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. Whereas by one man's disobedience, first Adam, the many were made sinners, so by one's disobedience, the many would be made righteous. The first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Oh, and a and what can you say except, amen, it's, it's so wonderful to be a member of the Christian race, the member of the Christian generation because of the work of Christ. So we worship Jesus Christ, the second Adam. And we worship Jesus Christ because he is our substitutionary sacrifice. And there's no way we can really separate the two. But since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation. Now, of course, uh, Ryan gave a, a really impassioned, every time he talks about propitiation, he just go. you just say, okay, here it comes, because he's just, he's given to the fact that the payment of our sin, the fact that Jesus Christ took upon the wrath, and also took on the payment for our sins. So Jesus Christ, our substitu substitutionary sacrifice, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he partook of the same things, that through his death might dis destroy the one who has the power of death, and that is the devil. All right, so he, we worship Christ, the second Adam. We worship Jesus Christ because for his substitutionary death to be founded to be moved through by the fact that he came in the flesh he became a man and lived sinlessly and we worship jesus christ because he's the mediator between god and men someone to come between god and ourselves to bring us back to him we needed a mediator who could represent us to god and who could represent God to us. That's a two-sided thing. That's what reconciliation is. He represented us to God, and he represented God as he dealt with us, because we realize that God is holy, and Jesus Christ is also holy, but lived a sinless life 
through all the temptations, and now he is ours. He is, he is our brother, and he is the one who has saved us. Um, for there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And certainly we're, he was a man, and he did represent us to God, and he is our one and only mediator. I'm reading a book about the life of Martin Luther. I'm blown away uh, about the, the, the horror of a guy who really wanted to know God, was stymied time after time. He did so many things. I, the things that he did to, to ultimately earn his salvation, to feel that he finally had in, in hand the fact that I could be nearly like God, perfectly done, but yet he knew he couldn't. And it frustrated him to almost the point uh, of a suicide. The, the guy that was listening to his, to his confessions finally just, he, well, he was frustrated. It would go on for six hours. He would find new areas where he was, and then he would find another area. Then he'd move more furniture and find more areas. And, and the guy said, this is overwhelming. I, I, I cannot believe that you're still going on and finding new things about. And he knew he was totally corrupt, but he also knew that there was nothing he was doing that was bringing him what he would believe would be close to God so that God would receive him. And I'm just thinking all of that stopped uh, with that one mediator, the only mediator between God and man, and that, of course, being Christ, being the blood of Christ. Philippians 5.11, uh, we worship Christ, our perfect example. Uh, we don't want to be represented by that first Adam. We want to be represented by the second. And Jesus, we worship him as our perfect example. Jesus became a man in order to live as our example and our pattern in life. Has that become part of your life? I live... Because I've got the pattern, I know who God is, I know who God in human form was, I get to know how he thinks, I get to know how he responds to his father, I get to know how he treats other men. Have, have we really got that as being the most important thing in our life, and that is becoming closer and nearer Christ, becoming more like him by letting the word of God and what it tells us about the God-man intersect our lives, and it just stretches into other areas. We're no longer doing it because we're trying to earn salvation. We're doing it because of who he is and what he did. Having this mind in yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, yes, he was the God-man, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. For to you you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Uh, many of you know I just found my, my 19, what, 37 copy of In His Steps. You know, it was on, we're, we were cleaning out books, having a grand old time, and this thing popped up, and it just, get, that gives me a warm feeling. I love books like that, but it just re reminds me that when I was a teenager, having read that book, even though it has many, many flaws, and, but the thought is the same. Are you following in his steps, in his example? Are you using the pattern of his attitude in life? in which to conduct your life. Hebrews 12, 2, looking into Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Because Jesus is our perfect example. Well, we worship Jesus, and there's a reason why he came, because he has become our sympathetic high priest. 
For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. And of course, back to Hebrews 4, 15, 16, we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize. This has come up many times during our Christmas season. One who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we might receive. Mercy and grace to help in time of need because we have a sympathetic high priest. He would not have been able to know by experience what we go through in our temptations and all the struggles of life, but he lives as a man able to sympathize more fully with the experiences that you and I have every day at a way, such a, such a lower level we live our life, but Jesus Christ was tempted in those very ways, yet without sin. We worship Christ. He is the firstborn from the dead. Now, you can have a lot of fun. Of course, this has been expressed many times from the pulpit at Bethany, the fact that he was the firstborn from the dead the pattern for the bodies that you and I will later have. We now have a physical body like Adam's, but we will have one like Christ. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 49. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. I'm so glad that that man of, of heaven, that human of heaven, uh, who is both man and God, I'm so glad that we can bear his image now, the man of heaven, rather than just the man of dust, firstborn from the dead. Um, and then worship Christ because he is the God-man forever. Jesus did not temporarily become man, this is an important point. Instead, his divine nature was permanently united to his human nature. He lives forever, not just as the eternal Son of God, the second person in the Trinity, but also as Jesus, the man who was born of Mary, and as Christ, the Messiah and Savior of his people, Jesus will remain fully God and fully man, yet one person and one person only forever. I remember Martin Luther was struggling because, of course, the, the whole idea of, of the way in which it was conducted was God was a bully. He was, yes, he was holy, but he's, you know, he's unforgiving. He's severe. And so we need somebody who will give it the softer side. Well, come up with a religion, something like the mother of God who might be softer towards sin. And so maybe we ought to extend our pleas to her. Well, it went even deeper than that because Martin Luther was a proponent and a great lover, I guess you would say, or proponent of Mary's mother because she, he figured that he would have, if he got two of the ladies on his side, then you know, it was going to be even that much better. So that was St. Anne. In my, in my hometown, there was a St. Anne school, and they used to, I remember they used to wear little shirts that said SAS, SAS, you know. So that's kind of what we called them. You know, I, I'm ashamed of that, perhaps. But, but uh, St. Anne school, it was, it, that's the mother of Mary. So, it is the mother of the mother of God who is also the one that he would, apply, he would apply himself to and lend himself to. And I was just thinking how sad that is because the, the human mother of Jesus who is God in human form. You know, when we say the mother of God, I guess you could say technically, well, she is. She is the mother of the Son of God who came, the human that came, and he is the Son of God. Now, I, I know that Mary would be just 
chagrined. I, I, I cannot imagine how someone whose heart now is beyond vexing, you know, you can't, you can't bother her with this, but, you know, every time in reading this book, my heart just got heavy for people who believe that there, there is no mediator uh, except the ones that happen to be of an institution. And uh, it's, it's very sad. The God-man forever. Jesus, the man who was born of Mary, and as Christ, the Messiah and the Savior, he will remain fully God and fully man, yet one person forever. Comments, there are, there, there's got to be. I mean, this was a, this is a ton. They always give us a ton. Now, now I want to move into pages 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. And it ain't happening. You know, you just can't do it. The rest of it is, is kind of fun. I call it pretzel world because what they're actually doing is just saying, okay, let's combine the biblical text on the deity and humanity. How could Jesus be omnipotent and yet weak? How could he leave the world and yet he's present with us all the time? How could he learn things and yet be omniscient the whole time? Hmm, puzzle that. Um, one nature does some things that the other natures do not. Uh, Jesus has returned to heaven, but he's present with us. He was temporal while he was here, but he is eternal. He was weak and all-powerful. Um, I, I love this because we've gone through it in the book of Luke. Thanks, Pastor. Appreciate it very much. He was weak and powerful. In his human nature, Jesus was weak and tired. But in his divine nature, he was omnipotent. Particularly striking is the scene on the Sea of Galilee. He was asleep in the stern of the boat because he was weary. And he was able to arise from his sleep, calm the wind and sea with a word, tired yet omnipotent. Here Jesus' weak human nature completely hid his omnipotence until they, uh, that omnipotence broke forth into a sovereign word from the Lord of heaven and earth. And there are, there are many puzzles and, and things that were, you know, really interesting to, to, to look into. And, well, I could furnish you with these things so you could look through them, but it's just impossible to cover all of them. Um, this is one thing, and I... I thought this before, not because I'm a great thinker, but I'm thinking, those who find the doctrine of incarnation inconceivable have sometimes asked whether Jesus, when he was a baby in the manger at Bethlehem, was at the same time upholding the universe so it wouldn't fly apart. Go think on that one for a while. And I do. I, I really love that. I'm thinking of this little baby. Well, if this little baby who had to be, of course, nursed and changed and fed and all of these things, if that little baby were able to lose attention of the fact that that baby was omnipotent God, then the whole universe would fly apart. So I'm thinking, do you think I'm going to be able to explain that? I'm not. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to enjoy it thoroughly. Jesus died and did not die. In a similar way, we can understand the human nature. Jesus died in the, his human nature. But with respect to his divine nature, he did not die, but was able to raise himself from the dead. Yet here we must give a note of caution. When Jesus died, his physical body died. His human soul or spirit was separated from his body, passed into the presence of God, the Father in heaven. In this way, he experienced a death that is like the one we as believers experience if we die before Christ returns. And it is not correct to say that Jesus' divine nature died or could die. If die means a cessation of activity, of consciousness, a diminution of power, nevertheless, by virtue of union with Jesus' human nature 
and his divine nature, somehow he tasted something of what it was like to go through death. The person of Christ experienced death. Therefore, even though Jesus' divine nature did not actually die, Jesus went through the experience of death as a whole person, both human and divine natures, somehow shared in that experience. Beyond that, Scripture doesn't enable us to go or say anymore. There are some things that, you know, when you get to the, the culmination of, and figure out this is very God and this was fully human, and how do those things interplay with each other? Um, I, 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 think, I think there's time in the playground of your mind to, to think some thoughts like that. But you know what you're always going to end up thinking? This is not a contradiction. This is a wonderful experience of our fi finiteness. We can't get it. We don't understand it. We love it, and we believe it. Okay, comments, anyone here? we got about two or three minutes. I say comments because I don't want questions. His own holiness, yes. Yeah, yeah, it is. Thank you. I'm glad you're 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 seeing this for having. And just totally absorb yourself and 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 marinate it and, and all of these kind of truths. Wayne Grudem said the incarnation is by far the most amazing miracle of the entire Bible, far more amazing than the resurrection and more amazing than even the creation. Of course, all of this is arguable here. That the creation of the universe, the fact that the un, infinite, omnipotent, eternal Son of God could become man and join himself to a human nature forever so that infinite God became one person with finite man will remain for eternity the most profound miracle and the most profound mystery in all the universe. I get that. I see that that is, that is very strong, an argument like this may be the most amazing... Well, it is the most amazing miracle that could ever happen. And that miracle happened in your life because of him, his work. Okay. Anybody else? Let's pray. Dear Father, we, our eyes just uh, sometime at some point just uh, are wobbling as we kind of consider how this finite man of a body that we have, humankind, uh, is linked inseparably to that which is infinite, has been forever for eon. And we just pray that you might help us to realize that the preciousness of the gift that you gave when you came down and took upon a human robe, lived a perfect life, suffered rejection from the ones that you had created and for the ones you have power over, the ones you had authority over, and still do it with the wondrous grace and mercy and love that you did, that took, that came to be our reconciliation how you could represent us because of that to your Father and how Father has drawn near because of your work. 
We're so thankful for our 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 love of what you have done. We we don't even know how to to gain the depths of it. We just want to thank you one more time for coming, for living a good life, the perfect life, for dying for us and giving permission uh, for yourself to die and then rising from the dead, a new body, the kind of body that we're going to have in the resurrection and we're going to be free from all the encumbrances and of the fact that we are just plagued by sin. Like Martin Luther was saying, it's just that his sin was dragging him down no matter how much he confessed. But Lord, I thank you that there is life in you, there is light in you, there's mercy, there's forgiveness, all the grace we need, and we thank you for Christ and all that you have done. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay. Thank you.